everyone. I'm Linda Tintawi, CEO of the Luskarton Foundation. Welcome to the final Luskarton Live of 2021. Today, we will report on our accomplishments from the past year and importantly, share what we are excited about in the future. You will hear about the tremendous progress we have made moving our research from the lab to the clinic. All while a pandemic has been ever present, it's not significantly slowing our progress or negatively impacting our fundraising. This past year, we launched several exciting equity and diversity initiatives, including the 2021 John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg Career Development Awards. The 2022 program is in process. We developed this year and will be launching early next year, the Luskarton Equity, Accessibility and Diversity or LEAD project. Stay tuned next year for details. The greater Luskarton community is bigger, stronger, and more resilient than ever. And I'm so proud of the extensive collaboration of the pancreas cancer research community who continue to innovate, lead by example, and push for progress. Thank you. And I'd like to extend special thanks to our 2021 Luskarton Live inaugural sponsors, Ipsen and Elevation Oncology. We'll have 10 minutes at the end of our presentation for Q&A and to your questions in the Q&A widget box on the lower left of your screen. We'll be live tweeting today's webinar. You can follow along or check the feed later. Just look for Luskarton FDN or at Luskarton FDN. I'm so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Andy Rakeman, Dr. Dave Tubison, and Dr. Elizabeth Jaffe. Dr. Rakeman is the Vice President of Research at the Luskarton Foundation. Dr. Tubison is a physician scientist. He's the Foundation's Chief Scientist and Director of the Luskarton Foundation Dedicated Lab at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Dr. Tubison is also the President of the American Association of Cancer Research and is the Roy J. Zuckerberg Professor of Cancer Research at Cold Spring Harbor Cancer Center. Dr. Jaffe is a leader in the field of immunotherapy. She's the Foundation's Chief Medical Advisor and the Director of the Luskarton Dedicated Lab at Johns Hopkins and Director of the Luskarton Clinical Accelerator Initiative. Dr. Jaffe is also Deputy Director of the Sidney Kimball Comprehensive Cancer Center and Co-Director of the Virag Center for Pancreas Cancer Clinical Research and Patient Care at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Welcome everyone and over to you, Andy. Thanks, Linda, and thanks for, for joining us, uh, Dr. Jaffe, and I think uh, Dr. Tuvison may be having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties, but hopefully we'll be on in, in a moment. And I'm so excited to be here with everyone today and to talk about the progress that we've made this year. One, because it's always exciting to talk about scientific progress, but also because this has really been an exceptional year with some fantastic progress across all of our priorities, great stories to tell, and I think progress that really underlines the importance of having a foundation like Lust Garden out there and how the way that we work in really supporting fundamental research with a focus on how to turn that into impact for patients is, is paying off. And I think you'll hear that through some of the stories that we'll tell today about the, the progress that, that's happened this year. Um, so to, to set a little bit of the background of how we'll be talking about things, but Lust Garden there's lots of things that we can discover about science and lots of research that we can do. And at Lust Garden, we'd like to prioritize by focusing on what are the areas where there's greatest need from the patients, where there are key scientific gaps where we can make progress, and then tying together that need and progress turns into impact for patients. So the areas that we focus on that you'll hear about is driving new technologies to help us better detect pancreas cancer earlier. To, we, too many people know the story of pancreas cancer being diagnosed too late. We want to be able to change that in the future. Driving towards new drugs that will be safer and more effective in treating pancreas cancer by targeting the biology that underlies the disease. And then learning how to best use those drugs in patients. So learning from the patient about how to use the right drug at the right time or personalized approaches and personalized medicine. Um, so I think, like I said, again, what you're gonna to hear today is some vignettes from each of those. It won't be all of the progress that we've had, but I think some of the key areas of highlights um, that I think underline that story of how investment in basic research is turning into impact for patients today. So starting off, uh, maybe to talk a little bit about what's been happening in, in earlier detection. And for people that have been following along in the news, it's been a lot of excitement 
um, and progress towards looking uh, forward in, in development of what we call liquid biopsies to, to detect uh, uh, all kinds of cancers, including pancreas cancer. And I think there's been uh, some exciting news this year in terms of large commercial investments that have really helped to pull some of this research out of the, out of the lab and drive it forward uh, towards progress. Uh, towards products, including some work that we funded with Bert Vogelstein early on uh, to develop a tool called CancerSeq that's now been acquired by one of the largest cancer diagnostic companies out there, Exact Sciences, a, co a company that makes uh, Colaguard. So I don't know, uh, Dr. Tuvisen, maybe we can start with you a little bit since you've been able to, to join us now. Um, could you tell us a little bit, you know, set the stage for folks, what are these liquid biopsies? What are they? hope to be able to do for patients, and how was the investment of the research really set the stage to drive this field forward? Yeah, thank you, um, Andy, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for coming to, to our session. Um, even people's dogs have come to this session. Um, and so the investment in trying to develop an early detection test has been going on for several decades by the Les Garden Foundation. It started with us investing in determining what genes are mutated in pancreas cancer. And that was a work done by Bert Fogelstein at Johns Hopkins some time ago. Bert followed up his early work on studying the cancer cell genome with uh, developing tests to look for changes in the blood that could tell us that the patient had a tumor, even a tiny tumor. And so as Andy was saying, he developed a test called CancerSeq which could find 15 characteristics of cancer in patients that had eight different types of cancer, including pancreatic cancer. This was studied in a large number of, of patients, found to be useful, and as Andy said, has actually entered the commercial pipeline to see how good of a test could it be to detecting cancer early across a big population. Now, of course, our focus is pancreas cancer, where if we could detect this disease early, our scientists and our physicians have shown us that these patients do better. Some of them had cancer 20 years ago. And so what we are trying to do is develop a group of people um, who will be detected super early, so a, a surgery will take care of everything, or even people that we think have cancer where we can't see it, where the type of trials that Liz Jaffe is uh, designing could even prevent the onset of early cancers. And so the blood test is, is one of the methods. We are trying to develop a better blood test, and, and, I, and we will, it will take more research, I think, to get it to the next level, because the tumors we're trying to detect are the size of a, a grain of rice. And there aren't tests in medicine where you can see a grain of rice on a scan. And so we are trying to come up with the most sensitive ways to do this. And it's really our basic research which has got us to this point. Um, we're very excited about cancer seek becoming um, acquired by a major uh, a test developer in the United States. And we know this is like our foot in the door and now we just have to keep opening that door. Uh, and so we have a lot of basic research to still do with Bert and others working with the Les Garden Foundation. And that's why those of you supporting us, it's so important because you know we wanna test, just like when you go to the doctor's office and they say your cholesterol is high, that doesn't mean you're gonna have a heart attack. But if you have chest pain and the stress test is positive, then they're worried that you're gonna have a heart attack. So we now have a cholesterol test. We need to get to that next level where we can actually develop functional tests that will tell us that the patient has a little bitty cancer that no one else can see. And how can we either use surgical, surgery to remove it or immunology to extinguish it? Those are kind of the exciting uh, things on the horizon. So uh, back to you now, Andy. No, th thanks, Dave, and 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 I like the way that you set that up when you talked about, you know, this where we are today really came from those early studies from Bird of understanding what are the changes, the genetic changes that happen in cells when they become a tumor and when tumors first form, um, and I know now that there's we were, and we were just having a discussion recently with our scientific advisors, looking forward of what's going to be the next frontier there, right? How do we push it, push it even earlier? Um, so I don't know if maybe you can make a make a couple of comments or talk a little bit on you know where where the the next frontier that we would want to go where are the gaps in understanding of the events that happened even before that 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 lead to where somebody is likely to develop a tumor or as, or as you said has the high cholesterol of, of pancreas cancer 
Um, and what's it going to take for us to to be in the position to detect precancer at some point in the future, the, the way that we are now with cancer screening? Yes, yes. Th th thank you, Andy. And so, um, again, we know that genes are part of cancer. You need bad genes to develop cancer, but genes aren't enough. Other things have to happen. And, um, and so we are looking for the other things and we, we have a pretty good idea of what they might be. It relates to the pancreas itself. The job of the pancreas is to allow you to digest food and balance blood sugar. The pancreas is a important and vital tissue in your body. You can't live without it. And when, inflammation happens in the pancreas, the digestive enzymes made by the cells turn on themselves and they digest the pancreas itself. And that's called pancreatitis. It's a painful event um, in some of you who've had it before. And inflammation of the pancreas is dangerous. And we think inflammation of the pancreas promotes pancreas cancer, even in people that high risk for developing cancer because they've inherited a gene, for example. And um, so we have invested basic re resources and basic scientists who are studying inflammation of the pancreas, thinking that they're going to come up with new parameters that can be become part of a test for determining whether someone is on that path to developing pancreas cancer. And so we're investing in inflammation. And likewise, we're investing in something called the stroma which for those of you who have um, listened to me before, I talk about the tumor, the pancreas tumor as a oatmeal cookie and the oatmeal is the stroma and the raisins are the cancer cells. We're invested in understanding the stroma, that, that oatmeal part, because the stroma is made during inflammation and it supports cancer. And so we, we're studying the stroma and we're studying inflammation. We think this is important and we think it might be related to obesity. So again, obesity increases your risk of certain cancers, particularly pancreas cancer. How that, how that occurs, we don't know. There's no understanding of the link between obesity and cancer that I'm aware of. But we think part of it is through inflammation. You've also heard diabetes. If you get diabetes when you're 50 and you're otherwise healthy, why? You're in a risk category now that you may be developing pancreas cancer. Diabetes usually means part of your pancreas doesn't work well. You're not regulating sugar properly in your blood, either because you don't make enough insulin or the insulin you make doesn't work very well in the rest of your body. And so we've been studying, again, the other things besides the genes, because we think the environment within which the cells with mutations occur will really portend whether someone is or is not going to develop pancreas cancer and also gives us an awareness that this is someone we should really worry about as we develop these new tests versus someone we don't have to worry about. And so it, it is a more holistic approach we're taking. As Dr. Vogelstein is developing better and better blood tests, we are trying to supplement with other factors, other processes, which we believe are part of early pancreas cancer so that we can um, help physicians find it early in patients, and we can advise patients and their families about how to be followed up. And so this is kind of one side of it. Can we get a drop of blood and follow things? Can we talk to patients and develop a better sense of, of any risks they may have? The other is, it goes back to the point I made about the grain of rice. I, I mean, I, I made it in a way so you all know how big a piece of rice is, and um, it's small. Well, what if we could detect, develop a method that would see the grain of rice, if, if that grain of rice meant early pancreas cancer? Well, we would be interested in that. And, and we do also have investments in trying to determine whether fine-tuning today's tests you get in doctor's offices, which are generally x-rays or MRI or ultrasound, could any of those tests be tuned so they could see something really, really small? And if so, great. And, and you've all heard of nuclear medicine imaging, like a PET scans or bone scans. These are scans where a, there's a chemical entity which emits some form of radiation that you can see. It's more sensitive tests than just scanning through um, looking for water content or bone content. And so we, we also are investing in that. Are there 
fancy new ways for us to peer inside someone's body to ask, do they have that grain of rice? Um, we just had a meeting very recently where, where we brought in some really brilliant scientists from Johns Hopkins and Dana Farber and Memorial, um, Duke, across the country, to tell us how they think about pancreas cancer. And they've really raised our awareness that there are probably other ways to think about that grain of rice. And so we have a grain of rice project that needs a fancier title than that. Um, but the idea being, can we see those little tumors using any method? using physics and engineering, using chemistry and radiation um, isotopes um, to go with the blood tests that you hear that Dr. Vogelstein is inventing. So that's kind of where we are right now. I, I think the tests that we're trying to devise will be interesting for other folks studying other diseases. You know, the military who are always trying to see things before they, they exist, uh, you know, other, you know, cancers, non-cancers, all of that. Of course, our focus is pancreas cancer. So along the way, we're probably going to make health better for all kinds of other folks. Um, but that's the team you're on when you're supporting us. So, so thanks again, you know, for all your support. No, th thanks, Dr. Tuvison. And I think it, it's always important to look back and see how it really was that early investment in, in trying to understand the biology underlying genetics and the genetic changes that happen in pancreas cancer led to the place where we can think about detecting cancer after it forms in people with pancreas cancer. And now looking forward of what are those other events we've identified, the types of events that we might be able to detect. And then hopefully over the coming years, those are gonna to continue to progress and turn into other kinds of treatments that can push it, other kinds of methods that can push detection earlier and earlier. And I had a Freudian slip there to treatments because that's ultimately where we need to get to, right? I mean, it's one thing to be able to diagnose somebody with pancreas cancer, but in, unless we can really have treatments that are gonna be safe and effective at eliminating that at, at whatever stage, um, we, that's really where we, we want to be able to be and need to be able to be. And I think this is where, you know, one of the most exciting things I think that has happened this year is under Dr. Jaffe's leadership, this launch of, launch of the Clinical Accelerator Initiative, which, you know, was born on this recognition that there is lots of great science coming out of the lab where there are potentially new ways to get at pancreas cancer and how do we get those into the clinic as quickly as possible? So since this is really, you know, your uh, your your brainchild here, uh, Dr. Jaffe, I'll let you, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what the CAI is and why this is so important, and maybe a couple examples of the the new studies that are being launched uh, and why they're so exciting. Absolutely, thanks, Andy. Um, so just to give a historical perspective, you know, pancreatic cancer patients historically have not had a lot of clinical um, trial options that were based on understanding pancreatic cancer. Often we repurposed drugs that were working in other cancers for this reason, because we didn't have a lot of science uh, enlightening us as to how pancreatic cancers develop and metastasize. But as you heard from Andy and also a bit from Dave, you know, the science that Lustgarten and others have invested in over the past few decades has led to a lot of interesting discoveries about pancreatic cancer, as well as new ways to potentially treat these cancers. And so this is really an opportune time for us uh, to say, wait a second, what do we need now? Well, what we really need now is to be able to very rapidly test agents, new, new drugs that that were developed from these new discoveries in patients with pancreatic cancer. And so that's what this is. The um, Clinical Accelerator Initiative is really a means to very speedily, you know, to speedily test these new discoveries in our patients with pancreatic cancer. Importantly, we also don't wanna do these big trials. We're trying to do smaller trials that will hopefully benefit the patients who are enrolling on the trials, but also trials where we can get biospecimens and learn how that drug is working so we can make it better. And we wanna make it better in real time. So these trials are nimble, they're fast, we're learning quickly because the technologies we have are so advanced now that we could take a small piece of pancreatic tumor and we could analyze it in so many different ways. We can look at that stroma Dave talked about, we can look at the genes in the tumor that are changing with the therapy. We can look at the other immune cells the, uh, that are, or inflammatory cells that surround the pancreatic cancer and infiltrate the stroma. 
um, and what's changing in those cells that may be helping the cancer grow, or maybe our drugs are inhibiting those cells so they're no longer helping the cancer grow. So this is a very important initiative. And so thanks to all of our donors, um, all of you out there and others, we're able to very rapidly open clinical trials. And, and they're not cheap. Clinical trials are costly, even small clinical trials, because we want to learn from them and we want to move them quickly. So if, some, if a trial's working, we'll continue it. If a trial isn't working, we'll stop it, learn from the information, and then make the trial, make the drug better or add new drugs so that uh, that drug can work more effectively. And so in the past year and a half to two years, even with COVID, we've been able to identify really great science. Some of it was from West Garden funded studies, but we're looking nationally, internationally, at, clinical at um, discoveries that can turn into clinical trials. We have a process that allows us to very rapidly evaluate these studies or these new drugs, help the investigators who bring it to us develop the best clinical trial. And we also have a network of people who can really very quickly analyze the biospecimens that we collect with uh, treatment of patients. And so this is a very nimble process. We've gotten four studies approved in the short period of time so far. One of the studies that we're very excited about comes actually from Tyler Jax's laboratory, and that was a Luskarn funded laboratory, still is. And uh, what he had found, he and his colleagues working with him found they were looking at the immune system and why the immune system wasn't effectively targeting the pancreatic cancer. And there are many reasons for this, but they found one particular way in which they can redirect the immune system to recognize the cancer and kill it. And so they found that a triple drug combination um, that targets one of the immune cells that's very important to activate the killer T cells. So anti-CD40 is an agent that can actually reprogram some of those inflammatory cells sitting in the tumor that are helping the tumor grow. It reprograms them to actually activate um, immune cells that can actually fight against the cancer. So that's one drug. And then two other drugs that actually supercharge that immune cell. So you can activate the immune cell, but you still have to get it to really focus and really uh, be potent against the cancer. And those, these two other drugs, one called anti-PD-1, which you've probably heard a lot about, it's been approved for many other cancers, and another one called anti-TIGIT. So these are signals that were identified on immune cells sitting in the cancer, and now we can actually reprogram uh, the inflammatory cells in the pancreatic cancer to make it fight against that cancer. So we're very excited about that study. Another study that's uh, ongoing is a study um, that was funded before these four uh, trials, and this is ongoing. And this is a study that's combining uh, two drugs. One drug is actually infiltrating, actually re reprogramming the stroma that you've heard about to allow the immune cells to come into the cancer. So one of the big problems with these killer T cells is that they don't always get into the cancer. So by targeting a stromal signal, interacts with some of these inflammatory cells, both of which are helping the cancer grow, by targeting those and reprogramming them so that they're no longer suppressing infiltration by these killer cells, we now get the killer cells into the tumor. And this is a study that we're giving a particular agent called AMD 3100, um, along with uh, anti-PD-1, which again, supercharges those immune cells once they get in and they can kill the cancer. So those are two very important studies. One is already actively enrolling. We've enrolled more than six patients so far. Two more are being uh, uh, enrolled um, uh, most recently. So you can see how quickly we can move these. We're learning a lot. We've already done some of the science in these patients who have graciously enrolled because the studies are exciting and they have potential to help them. And we're starting to understand how these agents are working and hopefully how to make them even better for the next group of patients. So Andy, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. Jaffe. It's fantastic. And I think it's such a great um, testament to how really digging in and understanding the the biology, and in this case, the immunology for the trials that you highlighted, change how, how we think about treating. And I think as a lot of people have seen, this sort of revolution with new immunotherapies for cancer has transformed other cancers out there like lung and, and melanoma. Um, and we haven't seen that promise yet in, in pancreatic cancer, but it's this 
going back to basics and, and the fundamentals of what the immunology is, is giving us new paths that, that could, could lead us there. Um, but I think we'd also be naive if we said it's all going to be about the immune system. I know for, for you often, Liz, you, you get very excited about the immune system. You've led a lot of the, the research that brought us there, but there's other challenges in the biology of pancreatic cancer, and we want to keep that, that pipeline of new biology um, robust. So I know, um, Dave, you've championed for a long time us ramping up our efforts in terms of um, getting down to what, what are the Achilles heels multiple of pancreatic cancer and, and how can we drive towards them? And again, during this, this pandemic year, we've been able to launch another new program uh, looking at, at potential novel targets in, in pancreatic cancer in the lab. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about our therapeutics focused uh, RFP program and um, you know how we're really driving towards better understanding of the stroma inflammation, metabolism, and metastases to get at new drug targets that can feed in uh, to, to our CAI effort. Yes, um, uh, thank you, uh, Andy. And so um, as you've, you've all heard already, uh, Liz and myself bring two different perspectives to the table about how to tackle pancreas cancer. Um, what I've been trying to do is just pose potential avenues that then Liz and her team of, um, of really sophisticated and uh, excellent uh, uh, medical oncologists and surgical and radiation oncologists can work on in, in small clinical trials. And, and, and the targets that we're trying to identify are, as Andy talked about, the Achilles heel of pancreas cancer. We all remember the, the story of Helen of Troy and Achilles where he actually finally was knocked over because his arrow hit his, uh, his uh, heel where he didn't have armor. Well, pancreas cancer is the same. It's um, a pretty tough warrior, as you all know. It's tough. And we have not had any easy wins yet. We have learned a lot, and we help a lot of patients today that we couldn't help 10 years ago. But we want to help all patients a lot more than we can today. So for that to be the case, we have to have better therapies. And so the better therapies we're looking for are, again, what would be Achilles heel in this disease? Now, I mentioned just a few minutes ago inflammation. Now, inflammation, again, is when your pancreas is, um, has immune cells activated, the kind that are, respond when you have a cut on your skin. And um, they try to promote sterilization meaning kill the microbes, the bacteria and viruses if they're present, but also initiate healing. Now, inflammation in the pancreas actually promotes proliferation, growth of cancer cells. And the Lust Garden actually funded a project a few years ago that showed that inflammation directly could promote cancer cell division, the turning of one cell into two, uh, multiplying the cancer cells. And so we decided we wanted to ask for um, new ideas in the community. Did people, could people think of new ways to target inflammation uh, in patients? And by blocking inflammation, could we actually make the disease less tough so that the therapies that Dr. Jaffe is putting in the clinic have a better chance of winning? And, uh, and so we, we put out our request for proposals. We had many people respond to actually go after inflammation. And I do think in the next year, you're going to start to see some inflammation findings, which will lead to clinical uh, trials. The other topic is, are, are those who study the stroma. Now, I talked about the stroma as the oatmeal and the oatmeal cookie. The stroma is made by cells uh, in the pancreas tumor, mostly by fibroblasts. Um, fibroblasts aren't something that you think about or talk about over your kitchen table very often, but they are the cell type they actually make the cement. They make this, the, the oatmeal and the cookie. They're important because they heal cuts. But a pancreas cancer is a wound that will never heal. And therefore, it's more like a cement truck that just will never harden. And so it's just making all this cement. And we know that some of the fibroblasts make bad molecules that make it hard for the immunotherapies that Dr. Jaffe designs, make it hard for them to work. And so we're trying to reprogram the fibroblasts. And so we have a whole bunch of people working now on stroma, trying to modulate the stroma. 
modulate the fibroblasts, for example. Um, metabolism is something you think about as a health issue. Like, is my metabolism good? Or do I have a healthy metabolism? I, am I eating a balanced diet? Um, you know, all of that. Well, the tumor cell has their own metabolic needs compared to normal cells. You can think of tumor cells as adolescents who go away for the week for the first time and, and go to a lunch counter where they can eat all they want. And cancer cells are like that. They are just, they don't behave. They eat the dessert first. They make no sense. And they essentially parasitize everything good in your body just for their own benefit. And so the cancer cells have a, a weird metabolism. And that's good because anything weird becomes an Achilles heel. And so we have people working on met metabolic pathways of pancreas cancer and efforts to, again, design arrows that will hit those pathways. And then those arrows become weapons that Dr. Jaffe can use when she designs trials. The last uh, topic that um, Dr. Raitman mentioned is metastasis. Um, you've probably heard this term before. It's a Greek uh, term, which means spread. And um, the cancer that occurs in your pancreas is one that tends to leave the pancreas. I think it's mostly because the, the food is better elsewhere. And so the cells are, are motivated to leave. And uh, so they migrate. And when the cancer migrates, it's harder for doctors to help patients. Um, it causes more symptoms in patients. But it's not game over. It just means different game. It means we have to approach patients differently. We're studying metastasis to try to slow it down, stop it, maybe even reverse it. And, and so we're trying to develop new insights on metastasis that, again, could become new therapeutic targets, as um, Andy mentioned. What we're trying to do is weaken the disease so that the immune system will actually win. And um, that's, to me, the key here. Many therapies we have today are pretty good. We just can't give them every day. The side effects are too high. It makes the bone marrow weak. It makes the skin thin. It causes infections, maybe damage to other tissues. We want therapies we can give every day that hurt the cancer, but spare the body. And uh, these are the magic bullets you, you all have heard of before, because if we can get those and the immune system itself is not actually damaged by our therapies, then I, then I think the therapies that Dr. Jaffe is, is most excited about and world leading on will have a much better chance of, of, of working in pancreas cancer. And so again, um, I guess bullfighting is like not politically correct anymore, but if you remember how bullfighting worked, you weaken the bull and then you send in the matador. To me, the immune system is the matador. And what we're trying to do is have the first few waves of people who run around try not to get trampled, go in and weaken this disease. And I think if we can weaken it, the immune system will actually do a great job in the final uh, cleanup. So I, I use a lot of metaphors. I apologize for that. But again, I, you know, that, that's kind of how I look at it. And so we're, we're finding Achilles heels so that we can send Liz in our matador to actually win. So I'll send it back to you now. Yeah. No, thank you, thank, Dr. Jibbs. And I think lots of people may take offense at bullfighting. I don't think anybody's going to take offense to calling pancreatic cancer the bull in that scenario. So I think that that is an apt metaphor to use. And, you know, just to sum this up again, I think it's it's a wonderful example of how much of a different place we are in that we can talk about launching multiple science-driven new trials in a year, thinking about lots of different ways to target the disease. And maybe just to, to close this out, a real quick question for you, Liz. I, you know, how, when do we have enough trials? What, what do we really, what is the goal here from, from your study? I, I, you know, I think we, there's gonna be lots of options out there. We're driving to put more. Um, you know, do we need a trial for every patient group? Do we need a certain number or, or what, what's the goal here? Great question, Andy. So um, I think really what we want to do is develop trials based on the science that we're uncovering, uh, the discoveries that we're, that are teaching us how best to treat pancreatic cancer. And I think uh, both you and Dave have done a good job of explaining what we're learning, but we're not done learning. And so we still need to continue to support discovery work. And as we learn from that discovery work, we have to decide which of that discovery work will be best suited for developing drugs and testing in patients. So until every single patient 
that I've ever seen or it's going to see can tell me that they don't have metastatic pancreatic cancer anymore, that they feel good, that they're living a normal life, I don't think we're done. What I will say about clinical trials is that we do have to target multiple different stages. So we are targeting earlier stage, both uh, before surgery, right after surgery. Um, that's a more of an insurance policy that, so that once you take out the tumor, it doesn't come back. We're also targeting those who have tumor localized to the pancreas. Unfortunately, sometimes they're not surgical uh, uh, candidates right away. We're trying to turn them into candidates so we could take the tumor out eventually. So that requires new therapies. And then, of course, we're treating metastatic disease. So we have multiple stages. We're targeting all of those. Um, we're, we're thinking a lot about how best to provide the best discoveries to the different groups of patients. What I will tell you is that more than ever, I, I am optimistic that we are making progress. We're learning how to make these drugs better. And I do believe patients are already starting to benefit. So you know, even 10 years ago, when I signed someone up for a clinical trial, I'd have to say, this is experimental. It's never going to work. I don't have to say that anymore because our drugs have been working not as well as we'd like. I can't promise every patient they're going to be the ones who are going to, who are going to get the best benefit. But clinical trials are out there, and it's very important that patients consider them as part of their therapy, that this is really part of the, the entire therapeutic plan for cancer patients. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Liz. And I think it's, it's, Maybe a nice transition to make now where we, we go from really learning about and understanding the cancer and how that's going to tell us how to treat the disease to now thinking about, well, there's more that we can learn about the patient and and how do we really understand the patient and then know learn better about which tools to reach for in the toolbox or which drugs to go for. And that's you know how we think about personalized medicine here. And again, I think this 2021 was a was a big year in, in personalized medicine for pancreatic cancer with the launch of the PASS-1 study, which you're one of the, the leaders on, Dr. Jaffe. Um, so maybe you can take a minute, explain a little bit of you know what, what the PASS-1 study is, and again, how it's taking that deep science approach to, to really help us learn, not just about the disease, but about the, the patient as well. Yeah, we're very excited about the study. Um, it did launch uh, about a year ago, and, and we're we're doing very well uh, enrolling patients. This is a international study, so multiple sites in the United States as well as in Canada. Um, it's It's been terrific working with our Canadian partners. Uh, they bring a lot of tools to the table, as do we. And so uh, to analyze the tumors and understand uh, how our patients' tumors are responding. But what's important about this study is we're really testing the two standard of care chemotherapies we're randomizing, randomizing patients to one or the other. Both work about equally well. About 35% of patients benefit. The problem is we don't know who is going to benefit up front. And just because you benefit from one, that doesn't mean you're going to benefit from the other. And so actually Dave Tuvison, as well as others in the field, have identified a number of biomarkers that can help predict who may respond to one of the two chemotherapies. But there's no data out there uh, telling us definitively which of those chemotherapies will be best for which patient. And so we're randomizing patients to the two best chemotherapies. This is new metastatic pancreatic cancer. And we're doing a pretreatment biopsy, and then we're doing a during treatment biopsy, and we're trying to understand what is going on in these patients um, with uh, uh, recurrence. So those who no longer respond or those who progress, we can take a look from their biopsy and compare that to the pretreatment biopsy. But the pretreatment biopsy is providing us with a lot of information. We're doing genetics, we're doing um, inflammatory analysis, we're looking at the stroma, um, we're looking at uh, panels of biomarkers that both David and others have predicted might be of benefit to these patients. And we're hoping that at the end of this study, we will have specific biomarkers to tell a patient, go on the fulfurinox, go on the um, uh, gemabraxane. These are the two chemotherapies that we have. But also the other important part of this is really critical, and this gets to the real personalized medicine. And that is that we're taking a piece of the pretreatment biopsy 
and we're st sending it to a lab at Cold Spring Harbor that is dedicated to making organoids. And again, this is discoveries coming from Dave's laboratory. And these organoids are basically three-dimensional structures of the patient's tumor that's growing short-term in culture. But what's nice about these is we're able to test a whole panel of different drugs to determine which of these drugs might be the next treatment once the patient's no longer responding to the initial treatment. Nobody's done this before. This is really different. This is really innovative. And if this works, we'll be able to better predict for patients what is the best treatment for an individual and not say, oh, go on this drug or this drug combination because we have a 10% response rate. And so we're trying to get at 100% response rate. Now that's not gonna happen today, but this is a very important piece of that puzzle moving forward for, to allow us to eventually be able to tell everything we need to tell from a patient's tumor so that we can design the best treatment right away for these patients. No, the, thanks, Liz. I, I, and I think the, the PAS-1 study is one of those that's so exciting. It's fun. It's, it's a large study. It's going to enroll a lot of patients, and it's really going to get at these very fundamental um, questions. And again, I think, as you pointed out, another great example on how it was because of investment in this early science, whether it was the development of the organoids or how to apply some of these other pro profiling tools that really enables this to move forward now and why you know, sort of right now is such an exciting time to make progress and turn, you know, discoveries into impact for patients. Um, and I think I know we're running a little bit long and I wanna make sure we get to some questions because there's some nice questions coming through. But one more thing that I, I just wanted a, a point to touch on, and I think the past study is a good example of this is, you know, Lust Garden is leading on a lot of these, is really comes with the, the patient first, comes with the science first, but knowing that that we can't do it all on our own. And so the past study is a great example of it's a trial that's being run internationally. It's a collaboration between um, Lust Garden and Stand Up and Pickard of Cancer Canada, all together driving this forward. And really by you know, opening up the tent and bringing everyone in um, under Lust Garden leadership, we're able to make uh, progress uh, that, that we couldn't uh, on our own. Um, and you know, one other thing to note here, another you know exciting development uh, from from 2021 that uh, uh, Linda referred to in the beginning is uh, Dave also has been serving as the the president of the AACR, or the uh, American Association for Cancer Research, uh, during this year. So again, bringing in people that are think a lot about pancreatic cancer and and are concerned a lot about pancreatic cancer into these leadership uh, positions, and really I think cementing the the role that. Um, Lust Garden and pancreatic cancer research in general, I think, has had in in sort of showing the way on on how to turn uh, biology into uh, promise and new treatments for patients going forward. Um, okay. you know, so, with that, unless unless uh, Dave or Liz wants to comment on on the quickly on the importance of these types of collaborations, um, we can look at some of the questions that come have been coming through and I know you know not not surprisingly this this is always a, a topic of interest a lot of folks asking about um, pancreatic cancer risk and specifically if there are family members with risk or even in some families where it appears that um, you know unrelated individuals get pancreas cancer at the same time and is that pointing to an environmental risk there so I don't know if one of you can you know comment a little bit about you know, what do we understand right now about the inherited genetics of, of pancreatic cancer and how family risk is and what the role of the environment uh, might be in, in development or risk of pancreas cancer? Know, Dave, do you wanna take a step? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll mention in response to that first, Andy. So um, pancreas cancer as a disease seems to have a familial predisposition 10% to maybe 20% of the time. So a patient with pancreas cancer about that often would say, I have a first degree relative who also have, has had pancreas cancer. And, uh, and the studies of, of, of these families has led us to understanding a lot about the causes of pancreas cancer. Some of the genes are in the cancer cells. Some of the genes are actually in 
other cells, like in the microenvironment, the stroma that could cause inflammation. And so, you know, we're always trying to find new genes involved in the process because, again, it gives us an understanding, and understanding leads to new therapeutic options as well as new early detection and prevention opportunities. And so when, when someone says that they've had two family members who themselves are unrelated with pancreas cancer, it could mean, as Andy mentioned, that there's an environmental exposure. And environmental exposures, we know that are increased um, in patients with pancreas cancer include tobacco consumption, so cigarette smoking, um, and obesity. These are two, I would say, very well um, documented risk factors for, for pancreatic cancer. Of course, other diseases correlate with those two conditions. Um, but but when, when a patient tells us they have family members, usually the suggestion is they see genetic counselors. And um, there are terrific genetic counselors for pancreatic cancers at many of our academic centers throughout the country. And uh, they, they have been a huge help, I'd say, to patients and their families. And they, they would actually ask you a lot of questions about your family. And if appropriate, they would get a blood test from, from you and maybe from family members who don't have pancreatic cancer. And that would lead to a better understanding um, of, of your risk profile for this disease. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dave. And I think following on that, and this is something you, you'll, you can comment on, Dr. Jaffe, um, it's also the question about, well, if you, if you can identify folks who are at high risk of developing pancreas cancer, what then? What do we do? We talked a lot about wanting to start trials in all different stages after people are diagnosed. Are there things happening in people who are at risk to try to either prevent or, or intercept disease? Yes, uh, thanks for bringing this up, Andy. So, and, and I saw there was at least one or two questions asking this, and this is a very critical question because you know, if you can identify families, you want to be able to prevent them from getting this deadly disease. And if you think about um, prevention, where prevention works best and what, what works best to prevent cancer, it's actually human papilloma-virus-associated cervical cancer and other uh, cancers, head and neck cancers. And we know that we could vaccinate young people, 14, 15-year-olds, who've never been exposed and prevent them from getting uh, cancer. We do the same with hepatitis B vaccine, right? Um, liver cancer is prevented worldwide when you vaccinate early. And we, we vaccinate kids now at age zero, essentially, when they're born, we start the vaccines against hepatitis B. So that's what we're thinking. We're thinking, can we vaccinate people who might be at high risk for pancreatic cancer? Now, it becomes a little bit more different, a little bit more difficult, because when you look at models of uh, pancreatic cancer development, there's a lot of early inflammatory changes after the first genetic alteration. And the first genetic alteration is usually mutated KRAS. It's, it's mutated in pre-malignant lesions that lead to pancreatic cancer. So we figured that's a great target because we don't have a viral infection to target. So this is acting like the viral infection or the virus. And so, but we also know that we already have some early inflammatory and stromal changes that we have to deal with too. And so what we're trying to do is not only target mutated KRAS as in a vaccine, but also create that vaccine so that it has signals that can alter um, the tumor, the developing microenvironment, okay, to be the cells that are starting to want to help this pre-malignancy become a cancer. And so our first um, uh, study, which is the first of its kind, um, just got FDA approved. It's going to be for a very limited population right now. The FDA still wants to show safety, which I agree. And so we're only allowed right now to test it in patients who do have a family history who already have a pre-malignant lesion that we can see on a radiographic type of um, exam. And so that's who we're targeting. We expect to begin enrolling probably the first of the year. And we, we're targeting mutated KRAS. And we know from patients with cancer who we've used this vaccine in that it's safe and that we can see those killer T cells, those killer immune cells developing after we vaccinate. So we're hoping to see them also in our 
uh, uh, you know, patients who uh, have pre-malignant uh, lesions. And so that'll be the first start, but we're hoping to continue to make this better and to bring it to a wider group of people if it turns out that uh, this works well. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jaffe. And I think it's, it's very exciting to see when our different priority areas start to overlap. I think that's a great sign of progress too, right? Where being able to find people at risk and treat them is, is an exciting place to be in. And like you said, this is, um, you know, one important, and we hope that this, this approach will be, will be successful, but even just having the approval and being able to start thinking about pancreas cancer as important enough to want to intervene with people who are, you know, otherwise healthy is a, is a big step forward uh, as well. So it look, but definitely looking forward to more to come there and, um, you know, underscores the importance of finding safer ways to target and, and ways to find people who even earlier stages of the, of the disease. Um, maybe uh, changing it a little bit, a, a more um, sciencey question here. Maybe this is one you can take on, uh, Dave. Um, is there anything to say about the role of fibrosis in um, development of, of pancreas cancer and if, if Fibro fibrosis in other organs may or may not be predictive of uh, risk for pancreatic cancer or related at all. Well, we know that fibrosis is um, really a, a semi-quinone of, of a pancreas tumor. They ha it has a very rich desmoplastic stroma um, with the so-called oatmeal encasement of the cancer cells. Now, the role that the fibrosis plays in the pathogenesis of the disease is under intensive study. The fibrosis itself makes it difficult for blood to perfuse the tumor. And that has been tested in several clinical trials. If you were to reduce the pressure in the tumor, would patients do better? The phase three trial that was done with hyaluronidase recently suggested that there was not gonna be a mathematical benefit to patients. There wasn't a big enough benefit to make that a standard therapy uh, where chemotherapy was combined with hyaluronidase in a randomized trial. But there's, I'd say a lot of ample, there's ample evidence that when you reduce the pressure in the tumor, you get more things in, you can deliver more medicines. So we think fibrosis plays a role in drug delivery and we know it plays a role in modifying the immune response and the cancer cell response. And so right now it's kind of a, a sign that there's something wrong in the tumor. And what we're trying to do instead of just getting rid of fibrosis is change it so that the part of it that makes it hard for the immune system to work or makes it easy for the cancer cells to proliferate, that has changed. And, um, and so there's a lot of basic science and translational science investigations in this space. And, and actually, uh, satisfyingly, some of these ideas have worked their ways up to clinical trials that Dr. Jaffe is designing. He mentioned some of them uh, already. Uh, so yeah, fibrosis, it, it happens. I, I do think it's a type of Achilles heel, um, but it's not as simple as we need to make the fibrosis go away. It's more of we need to change the processes so that the things that make the cancer tough are weakened. And that, that's where, um, this uh, project is right now, or this theme. And I'm just gonna add one thing. Dr. Jaffe talked about a, a vaccine trial just now, really important. First of its kind, it'll be amazing. That is a partnership with Stand Up to Cancer um, and AACR. And, and we have found that our partners really allow us to extend our reach throughout the country and even across international borders. And uh, it's been, you know, really important uh, for uh, any of our successes. So, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Suvasan, Dr. Jaffe. I know there's more questions, people are interested. I know if we sat here and talked, we could continue on for another at least hour talking about the exciting things that, that are happening and that are to come. Um, but unfortunately, all, all good things will have to come to an end. But I hope that people really leave here with, um, with the understanding that these advances don't come from nowhere, that they are, you know, built on the, the paved on the road of research. Um, 
and and that's really what what enables them. It's that early investment and in understanding the disease that's letting us to have progress in terms of bringing things into impact for for patients. And you know, this 2021 was a fantastic year. 2022 is going to be even better for pancreas cancer, and hopefully better for COVID and everything else that that's that's been out there. Um, and you know, we look forward to hoping everyone on this call is going to stay with us on on this journey and help us drive uh, even uh, further forward and faster. So, uh, Linda, I want to give it back to you. Let you close it yeah. out. So great, thanks, Andy. And I think what today also really showed us. Um, is that the Lusgarten Foundation is truly the linchpin of the pancreas cancer community. And it's the work that we've been doing over all these years on which not just the Lusgarten Foundation researchers, but so many researchers who are working in pancreas cancer are, are building on. And none of our work would be possible without our major donors who are counting on our success and are foundational to the work that, that we are doing. And it's not just our major donors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's not just also our, our major donors, who again, we're so grateful for, but all of you out there who support our walks and who are the, the sponsors of our walks. And all these individual donors who year after year support our work. Uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, Drs. Tuvis and Liz and Rakeman, on behalf of our board, our board chair, Andy Lusgarten and Vice Chairs Jim Dolan and Adam Silver, we are all so grateful uh, for your for your support and for all that you uh, do for us. This has been a great talk. Our thanks to Drs. Jaffe, Tubison, and Rakeman. Uh, but before we go, I'd like to tease the 2022 Lusgarten Live program. You can look forward to on March 8th, International Women's Day, we'll present Women Rule the Pancreatic Cancer Research World. And on March 30th, we'll present Doctors' Day from the clinic to the lab how research led by Lusgarten is transforming patient care at your local cancer center. June 20th, we'll present a Juneteenth conversation, understanding disparities in pancreas cancer among African-Americans. In November, which is Pancreatic Cancer Action Month, we'll present the intersection of science and technology. And a year from now, we'll be back here with all of you presenting our 2022 research highlights. I'm very happy to announce that ViewRay a global company whose focus is MRI-guided radiation therapy will be the presenting sponsor for next year's Lusgarten Live program. We're thrilled to have them on board. Look for our newsletter this Thursday. The video link to this webinar will be included. Thank you to all of you. Happy holidays and all the best to you in the new year.